It's June Pride in Minneapolis, St. Paul, Minnesota, and locals here have a lot to be proud of. Minneapolis was named the gayest city in America by The Advocate in 2011. Minnesota Governor Mark Dayton vocally supports marriage equality. And for two decades, Minnesota has had laws protecting LGBT people from hate crimes and employment discrimination. Minnesota is an amazing place. It is uh, one of the most wonderful, embracing, vibrant, exciting states. Minneapolis is one of the most encouraging and open and affirming places that I have ever lived in as a gay man. We feel comfortable here, perhaps complacently so. But for all the acceptance that LGBT people feel, there are deep challenges here. This November, Minnesota will decide on a constitutional ban against same-sex marriage. And less than 30 minutes drive away from the joy of the parade, students faced the unthinkable in a community called Anoka Hennepin. Anoka Hennepin is Minnesota's largest school district, located just north of Minneapolis. This could be any suburban school district, but what happened here is anything but typical. A lot of my friends didn't want to go to school. There's a lot of self-harm, a lot of hospitalizations, basically a crumbling of the lifestyle of students in our school district. Starting in 2009, students in Anoka Hennepin began taking their own lives. I ended up trying to commit suicide and it got very hard. My best friend Samantha Johnson took her life November 11th, 2009. I am the mother of Justin Alberg, um, who died by suicide uh, in July 2010. One of the victims was 15-year-old Justin Auberg, an accomplished cello player. He came out to me when he was 13, but then after he died, I found out that he was outed like a few months before that. And many of his friends told me like all of his guy friends, except for one, stopped being friends with them or started teasing him. And these two boys, I guess, grabbed him in the, in the, in the, in, in a tunnel and said, you like that, don't you? Um, his friend, one of his friends, saw him crying a little bit down the hallway. The next morning, the counselor called the friend down and said, did Justin end up telling you what happened? And she said, yeah, you know, things like this happen to gay kids all the time. And she didn't ask any further what had happened. Um, didn't, I didn't get a phone call. He told me a few months before he died that, you know, he was told that he was gonna go to hell because he's gay. And I'm like, no, that isn't true. God loves everybody. So when you have, you know, your school not really sticking up for you. And you have parents and students telling you this. It's kind of like you lose your hope. Because he, he believed in God. He would always wear a cross. And thinking back, I don't remember him wearing that cross last few months before he died. From 2009 to 2011, eight other students had also taken their lives, a total of nine suicides in the school district. Dr. Daniel Reidenberg, Managing Director of the Minnesota-based Suicide Awareness Voices of Education, was the first to label the deaths a suicide cluster. When we talk about a suicide cluster, we're really talking about the defined community where you have a certain number of people, more than two, in a short amount of time, all dying by suicide, and somehow they're connected. In Anoka, Minnesota, I did talk about it as a cluster of suicides. There were many that were afraid to. But the reality is, is that it's best to identify it and define it as what it was. But what was the common thread? Attorneys at the Southern Poverty Law Center launched an investigation into what was happening. We were talking to a lot of students and families, and I remember one day in particular where I talked to three different mothers who had each lost their kid to suicide in one day. And what we were able to confirm is there was a shocking number of suicide deaths. What we also found is there was this hostile anti-gay environment in the school that was contributing at least to some of them. We did find evidence that at least four of the students were LGBT or at least perceived as being gay. Jefferson Fitek, an openly gay middle school arts teacher who had grown up in the area, decided to do something about the atmosphere. I really just put the words out to kids that, you know what, you can come into my room in the mornings and you can be yourself. And so we really started to attract a lot of the kids who 
were, you know, the goth kids or maybe didn't wear the best clothes or were maybe feminine or too masculine. And so my room became affectionately known as the land of misfit toys. But by talking about homosexuality, Jefferson was violating a school policy called No Homo Promo, stating homosexuality would not be taught or addressed as a normal, valid lifestyle. In 2009, the policy morphed into the Sexual Orientation Curriculum Policy, that staff shall remain neutral on matters regarding sexual orientation. The Sexual Orientation Curriculum Policy literally erased gay people. They didn't exist. There were teachers who received a memo that if you wore in support of these kids that you were violating the policy and you could be terminated or worse. They came up with this gag policy. The way they sold it was saying, we're just neutral on the issue of sexual orientation. We're not for it, we're not against it, but basically it's a better to be talked about by your families, your churches, at home, but not at school. We talked to kids who felt there was no one to reach out to. I've got death threats from people telling me if I didn't leave the city, they'd kill me. I got people calling me fag, push me in the lockers, saying that I should just go kill myself and that no one really cared about me. Well, I was bullied, harassed, tormented a ton for reasons because I had two dads. I was stabbed in the back of the neck, choked in the bathroom, called gay, faggot, a ton. I was pushed down the stairs one time. I was urinated on by a student in the bathroom just called awful names. I was shoved into desks. I was locked in lockers. I had people call me sinners and throw Gatorade at me. And I had people actually take my personal photos and send them around the school. I got told by some of my old friends on the bus that I should go kill myself because my friend did. And did I watch it happen? I got prank calls every night. I was still have been getting them. As news media began to report on the story, Students, parents, and advocates pressed the Anoka Hennepin School Board to change the neutrality policy. But the board refused to act. Suddenly, the secret was no longer a secret. Suddenly, community members were talking about what these kids were going through. When confronted, school board members and the superintendent would say things like, this is political, there's not a problem. We were tired of being harassed and tormented through school and seeing other kids being harassed and tormented and we wanted to make a change. In June 2011, six students sued the Anoka Hennepin School District for failing to address bullying. The U.S. Department of Justice got involved and early this year, the school district agreed in a 60-page consent decree to end the neutrality policy and enact specific improvements to prevent bullying. The consent decree has been hailed as a historic moment in LGBT rights and has influenced Governor Dayton's anti-bullying task force to demand stronger anti-bullying statutes throughout the state. When we won the lawsuit, it was one of the proudest moments of my life, just being able to know that we were able to make a difference and we were heard. The roots of Anoka Hennepin's anti-gay policies stretch into the political makeup of the state. Andy Berkey, a reporter for the Minnesota Independent covered the case. The big players behind the neutrality policy in Anoka Hennepin uh, were socially conservative Christian groups. They created a group called the Parents Action League. They rallied at school boards and, and um, got involved in the school board elections. And they also worked to get ex-gay therapy references into the classroom. They were pretty much the driving force. Anoka Hennepin lies within the congressional district of Representative Michelle Bachman where she commands the loyalty of a deep political base of social conservatives. She and her husband own a clinic in Lake Elmo that has practiced reparative therapy. And this past June, America's largest ex-gay organization, Exodus International, held its national conference at a conservative Christian college in St. Paul. To Scott Dibble, an openly gay Minnesota legislator, the connections are obvious. I believe, absolutely believe that there is a nexus and, uh, and a connection between you know, a lot of these efforts around ex-gay therapy, this hostile response to efforts to address bullying in our schools. You know, in the common thread, it's this whole idea that GLBT people aren't legitimate people. It's, it's delegitimizing and dehumanizing who we are. House come to order. Years of efforts by social conservatives opposing LGBT rights have culminated this year in a push for an amendment to the state constitution banning same-sex marriage. To provide that only a union of one man and one woman 
in November. Minnesotans will be voting on whether to put a ban on same-sex marriage in the state constitution. Minnesota is one of the few states that either doesn't have gay marriage or doesn't have a marriage amendment. Um, so however November goes is probably how the state's going to go. The response from pro-equality Minnesotans to the proposed constitutional amendment has been fierce. I'm fervently opposed to the uh, amendment. We'd like our gay and lesbian friends to be able to make that same choice. I want to be able to marry the person that I love, and that's about as simple as it gets. We have to do everything we can to really stand up for the fundamental values that we all share in Minnesota. Minnesota United for All Families was formed literally minutes after the legislature proposed this amendment to the Constitution. It was formed by our two statewide LGBT organizations, Outfront Minnesota and Project 515. Our opposition is actually silence. Our opposition is, is a lack of conversation in this state about why this amendment is so hurtful and divisive. The one-on-one -on -one conversations are the only way that we can defeat this amendment. And it's up to every one of us to have those conversations. It is conversations like these that Minnesota United hopes to start among families, friends, and religious groups. I got involved because Minnesotans United decided to create a faith department that's kind of unique in this kind of work and this, in this kind of campaign. You guys are joking, right? No, we're serious. Seriously against limiting Minnesotans' freedom to marry. Sometimes we're reaching out to see if people want to have uh, conversations with us, and sometimes they're actually calling us saying, we want to be able to have a conversation in our parish. Some conversations are already happening at house parties all across the state. Our opposition in 2012 is silence. Have the conversation, contribute, whatever is personally significant. People are counting on you. The strategy seems to be working, as polls show that the constitutional amendment is losing support. No matter how the vote in November turns out, for Tammy Auberg and the kids of Anoka Hennepin who marched at Pride, breaking the silence is a welcome change. Being public about it, we helped maybe one more kid out there, one more teenager, one more middle-aged person accept who they are and see that it's not right to be treated as an unequal person.